In morning chapel yesterday, I introduced many of you to Lent and why the earliest Christians thought that 40 days of preparing for Easter was good for their spiritual health. We talked about the fact that Lent is patterned on Jesus' 40 days in the desert, which was not a punishment nor a personal endurance test, but it was a time set aside to cultivate listening to the Father's voice. We talked about the deserts in our life, deserts of depression, of spiritual dry times, deserts of grief, the desert of anxiety, and we realized that the Lord's will for us is not always to jump immediately out of the desert and get fixed, but perhaps to be present to the desert and to what the Father is trying to speak to you that you can only hear in the desert. Then last night at After Dark, we listened to how the accuser tempted Jesus in the desert. We looked at the armor that Jesus took with him into the desert, which was his baptismal identity. And that's also the identity that you've been given. The message of all baptisms is not, good job, you've decided for Jesus, nor are they, I hope you have enough faith to follow Christ now, nor, Get on out there and do good things for God and show him how grateful you are. All baptisms are rooted in Jesus' own baptism. That's why he was baptized, to redefine the meaning of baptism for all of us. And this is what Jesus' baptism is. You are my beloved child. Nothing else can break the power of sin in your life. True conversion is hearing this message to you in your very depths. But Jesus knew that we could not hear this message on our own. We can only hear distorted versions of this message. So that's why he heard it for you in his baptism. He heard it for me and for you. And he's saying, Listen, you're my beloved child. I don't love you because I have to, but because you're likable. Your identity is safe with me. You don't have to prove anything to me or to anyone else. Be safe in my love. Be forgiven. This is what Jesus heard in his baptism for us. And this is what armed him for the desert and for the voices of accusation which would try and subtly undermine that voice to him. And this too is your armor against temptation. So Lent is about purposefully walking with Jesus in whatever desert we're in. It is straining to hear the Father's words to you amidst temptation and sometimes despair. It is choosing for 40 days to analyze what voices am I listening to so that you can know the depths of sin in your life, sin and distortion, and also welcome Easter's resurrection with joy once again. Today we're gonna to follow some early Christians into the desert and see what they discovered about themselves and how they dealt with it. While Lent invites you to 40 days of kind of a self-imposed desert, these early Christians physically, not metaphorically, moved into the desert. Why were they going into the desert? Because some deserts we do have to choose for ourselves. The Roman Empire in which they lived was so decadent that they felt they could not stay without slowly giving in to who the Roman Empire wanted them to be and who it was telling them that they were. Many thriving centers of the Roman Empire were just 60 miles from the desert, so the desert was always nearby. And so, in the middle of the third century, there was a mass exodus of people who went to the desert. And it all started with a man named Anthony. At the age of 18, Anthony's Egyptian parents died, leaving him with a vast amount of money 
And around the same time, he happened to be walking by a church, and as he was walking by, he heard the priest reading the Gospel of Matthew, and right as he was walking by the open door, he heard the priest saying, to be perfect, go, sell all you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. That very day, Anthony did that. He gave up everything, and he moved to the Nitrine Desert in Egypt and set up shop in a tiny hut. Now, one contemporary nun, who is currently a hermit, writes of the desert like this. Consider what the desert or any wilderness is like. You are there, God is there, and often, with the exception of wild animals, that's pretty much all there is. At every moment, you are thrown back upon yourself and God, though you may not realize his presence at this point. To survive with the perhaps unknown grace of God, you must find the resources within yourself to hunt, find water, create shelter, protect yourself from predators, stave off hunger, the weather, boredom, hopelessness, and tedium. You must manage your own bodily needs, take care of your injuries, illness, etc. And this will mean dealing to some extent with your own insecurities, your own fears, prejudices, ignorance, and allergy to failure on a daily and even hourly basis. You will not survive otherwise. Further, you must deal with loneliness, isolation, the loss of all those things that made life valuable in worldly terms. There are no books, no electric lights, no TV, computer, musical instrument, iPod, nothing to distract you from yourself and the God who summons your truest self. Even while one is working quietly, one's mind is churning and one's heart is often in turmoil. And perhaps, perhaps, you will begin to seek out God. If so, the heart that is in turmoil is the place that you will enter. If you thought the region outside you was wild and threatening, wait until you enter your own heart. Now, there was a, a biography written about Anthony just years after his death. And it says that Anthony, when he went into the desert, he did battle with the demons, the names of which were boredom, laziness, and sensuality. Time Magazine did a big article on Anthony and why he is still such a contemporary for us today. And in the Time article it says, quote, Satan was hard to recognize in the desert because usually he looked like the things that Anthony missed most. Okay, there we go. As Anthony began to deal with these temptations, the story personifies them as demons. Yet it's clear that these are thoughts arising from within Anthony. Whether or not these are actual demonic presences or simply Anthony getting to the bottom of the darkness in his own heart, you get the idea. Anthony discovered that his sinful, disturbing thoughts did not disappear in the desert. They became stronger. And at first, he tried to ignore them. He tried to push them away. But neither approach worked. But then Anthony had a breakthrough, and he realized that his thoughts mattered. Whoops. His thoughts mattered. They had to be taken seriously. Otherwise, he could never confront them. Anthony began to realize that instead of being ashamed of his thoughts, he had to allow them to bubble up to the surface. So Anthony began, all by himself in the desert, a practice that is now the foundation for all spiritual direction, therapeutic counseling, and pastoral listening. Anthony began to train himself to notice his thoughts and lay them out one by one before him rather than ignore them.
Now here's a painting by Michelangelo, which portrays the thoughts attacking Anthony. And this is how he first experienced it, as just this overwhelming attack, unable to fend them off. They're all together coming after him. And Anthony found that he could not disconnect from these thoughts. And many of you know the same situation, unable to turn these thoughts off. Maybe you've found that you can disconnect through alcohol, or I don't know, we all have ways to disconnect. But Anthony refused to disconnect. Anthony laid them out, he acknowledged them, and as he did, much of their power dissipated. This is a painting by Dolly, um, so I guess about 100 years ago. Um, and here you see Anthony, no longer are the thoughts just all beating at him at the same time, but now they're starting to take shape. They're starting to come at him. He's able to, to separate them out, to tackle them one at a time. And as you can see, Anthony's fighting them with prayer and scripture. This is what Anthony and all the Desert Fathers did. They counseled what was called watchfulness. They were the first to pay attention to their thoughts. They also were the first to physically move out of the chaos of their lives and to take these thoughts seriously. They didn't just believe in original sin, they took it seriously by analyzing it and beginning to understand its patterns in their lives so that they could fight it. Now much of the stories and legends that arise around Anthony have to do with Anthony fighting off the demons. And this has taken the central place in Christian art for centuries. Every century has a great classic written about Anthony or painted about Anthony fighting the demons. But an interesting one, uh, a subtle shift in beginning to understand the psychological uh, aspect of these influences happened in the late 1600s. And this is called one of the top 10 creepiest paintings in the world. This was by a Dutch artist named Jus van Kreisbeck. Not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But it's dominated by a monstrous head. This must be Anthony, although he's painted as a Dutchman in the 1600s, with eccentric figures walking in and out of his mouth, his ears, all around him. The top of the head is removed to reveal bats coming out and also for people to come in. And inside his head is the painter himself painting his own fantasies on the wall of Anthony's brain. So you're beginning to get a more psychological interpretation of evil thoughts, even starting around the 1600s. So Anthony, fighting these thoughts, realized that he, he'd come to the desert and he wasn't having success. And so he needed to enter what the Desert Fathers called the inner desert, or the full desert. Anthony was shocked to realize that even though he'd given up everything, status, honor, wealth, the possibility of a family, he was shocked to find he still wasn't perfect. And that's what Christ had promised him. Instead, in the desert, he found that these things still had a hold on him. And this is why every generation has been fascinated with Anthony. His story is our story. Desire for God, but also battling with desire for the things which harm us. One thing that began to slowly change in Anthony as he was in the desert is he went to the desert pursuing perfection. That's what the scripture said. You do this, you want to be perfect, do this and follow me. But Anthony discovered that maybe pursuing perfection, at least in this way, wasn't the right way to do it. He learned that just giving something up didn't have the power to break it. Nor does it really prove anything except for that we have exceptional self-control. Has there really been transformation, Anthony wondered? It was the Stoic philosophers who were incredibly self-controlled. Anthony realized Christ needed to offer something different than just self-control. And so at that point, Anthony, having lived in the desert for five years, moved into a deeper desert. And he did this by physically moving into a tomb. Now, I interpret this as Anthony finally beginning to understand Paul and what Paul is talking about, about our dying and rising with Christ. 
Have you ever noticed that Paul never tells us to get over temptation just by dealing with it? He doesn't say deal with it. He doesn't tell you to master your temptation, nor does he tell you to try harder to be perfect. Paul instead brings us over and over again to our baptisms. He brings us back to the mystery and the wonder that at our baptism, we have been united with Christ. Calvin says these words weren't meant so much for Jesus as they were for us. You are my beloved child. Now, like many of you, I grew up as a Christian from as early as I can remember, and I often wished I had a conversion story. Then I would know that I would have had this B.C., A.D. moment in my own personal life. But Paul, strangely, rarely mentions his conversion. Paul isn't going back to that over and over again. Paul was, realized he wasn't just saved. He'd been permanently united to Christ. So what Paul talks about over and over again is his baptism, what it means that he's died with Christ, what it means that he's been united and raised with Christ. And that was what he meditated on for the rest of his life to give him power over sin and temptation. And this is just in line with scripture that teaches us that we cannot confront our darker side in the presence of someone who we don't believe really loves us. But in God's loving presence, wrapped in the spirit of Christ, who was baptized and heard for you, you are my beloved child. Anthony was able to lay out his thoughts one by one and continue to fight them. Anthony discovered that only when he really was convinced that he was God's beloved could his disordered loves be put into proper order. The seductions and the promises of our disordered loves are exposed when we are truly known and loved, not only by God, but by other people as well. So, just on a little practical level, if you're isolated, and you have very little community and people with whom you're really being vulnerable with, and you're struggling with temptations and thoughts that you yourself cannot master, um, maybe you need to get yourself into community to begin. It's really hard to know God's love just as this abstract, isolated love. God gives you brothers and sisters who are there to be God's very tangible love to you. And often it is only when we are really known by our friends, and when we allow ourselves to get vulnerable like that, that also sin and temptation begin to open up their hold on our lives. And that's in part because many of our temptations have to do with acute loneliness and with feeling disconnected. So, Anthony himself learned this lesson, and we'll get into this at the end of my talk, about how isolating yourself maybe isn't the best way to overcome temptation and sin. So for 15 years in the tomb, Anthony lived in the full desert, battling his own demons, battling the lies of the false self. And interestingly, as certain demons subsided, as he began to finally uh, loosen their hold on his life, new ones would arise and take their place. Anthony never expected full victory over sin but he did expect sin to change and morph with each decade of his life. Talk to someone who's been a Christian for many more decades than you, and you can find out which sin plagued them in which decade of their life. It is said that towards the end of his life, Anthony battled despair, and he could only overcome it with a strict regimen of manual labor and prayer. In fact, to think that a trial was over, Anthony thought was dangerous. Just as Christ was tempted, Anthony did not take temptation to be a sign of failure. Instead, he said, you can't get into the kingdom of heaven without temptation. This is what prepares us for it. And side note, um, this is why during this exact same period in the church, um, this is just a really interesting historical note, but I find it actually has to bear on this topic. Um, men who had castrated themselves were not allowed into the church at this time. They were forbidden 
communion in the church. And this is because they had removed the source of their temptation. They had removed the very thing that was supposed to draw them into dependent living on Christ. And they were seeking the wrong thing. They were seeking perfection rather than weakness, as Paul preferred weakness. So Anthony was able to hold together an increasing knowledge of his sin with his knowledge, an increasing knowledge of the love of God. And it was this battle, his battle with sin and his battle to go into the depths of the love of God that made him the single most sought out counselor or elder in his, ter in his generation's terms of his generation. So funnily enough, Anthony's very success was his undoing. Because Anthony was so wise and gentle, people flocked to him. They set up huts around him, and so he would move deeper into the desert, and he'd find within a few years, there was a whole new community that had grown around him. He kept moving deeper and deeper, until finally Anthony realized, um, this has got to stop. <laughs> and even though Anthony's fantasy was to live life as a hermit all by himself, he realized that sometimes God does not give us what we think we need to be close to him particularly if it's not going to involve other people. And so, even though Anthony had gone into the tomb to die to his old nature, he didn't realize that even this pursuit of perfection was part of his old nature and something that he needed to die to. He thought he'd heard Christ right, be perfect, do these things. So he followed the formula, and he realized that this was not perfection at all. He needed to die to a lot more. He needed to die to his individualism, his preening desire for sinlessness without others, and he needed instead to abandon himself to Christ, a life that was turned outwards towards the Father and to other people. So Anthony repented, not in the sense of being sorry, but in the sense of a radical life change and he decided it was time to stop being the autonomous holy man, which he'd always wanted to be. And instead, he needed to redefine his holiness relationally. He began to reflect on the fact that his fear of sin was actually egocentric. It was, he was worried about how God saw him. How did other people see him? And it was a kind of fear that made him actually turn inward upon himself trying to make him good without God and without others. And if you've ever um, wrestled with sin in this way, that it's actually wrestling with sin makes you turn inward upon yourself, talk to Matt Jensen up here, who did his PhD on sin. And I've learned a lot from him. He's, uh, he's helped me a lot understand even Anthony's orientation from one definition of sin to another. So Anthony did something quite expect, unexpected. He left the tomb and he moved into community. He began to organize the people who'd followed him into the desert into groups of two to six monks or nuns into these little kind of cellular blocks. Each would have a spiritual elder and each cell would be able to relate to each other but so you would have a space to have solitude and to spend time manifesting your thoughts and being in a place with no distractions where you could truly focus your prayer life uh, upon the Lord. But also in these groups, you would manifest your thoughts to the elder. You would open your heart to one another and you would expose your sin so that the devil would not gain a foothold. I almost feel like it's kind of like the mini version of living in a camp bunkhouse with a camp counselor, except you do it for the rest of your life. <laughs> And then, as these little cellular groups, which were spread out all over the desert, they began to realize, we're not even enough, the five or six of us together. We need other Christians. And so these little groups began to join together on Sundays, or for the weekend, and they would meet together, and they would sing psalms, and they would pray. And before you knew it, the desert had become a city, as one um, historian put it. There were 5,000 monks in one kind of desert area alone. There were 3,000 nuns in another area, and that's not talking about all the far-flung communities spread out all over the thousands of miles of desert. 
And this was all started by one 18-year-old boy going into the desert. Now for these groups that Anthony found himself having to organize, Anthony, the wannabe hermit, the guy who wanted solitude, Anthony found himself having to lay down rules or at least some kind of structure for these groups. But Anthony refrained from giving too many rules because he was too good a student of human nature by this point to impose uniformity on everybody. Some desert fathers were famous for their extreme penances, and you may have heard some of their strange things they did, and others were famous for their very moderate and gentle penance. There was nothing specifically prescribed as looking holy, except the need to flee your own personal temptations, which would be very different from another person's temptations. And this is why the desert fathers and mothers were ruthless about not judging one another. In fact, for many of them, they saw this as the greatest battle of the spiritual life. Each person has their own task before them, as each person is unique before God. Having a Christian template that you can master is actually pretty easy. Then you don't have to pay attention to what God is doing and specifically saying to you or to your neighbor. But refusing to judge one another in each other's journeys toward God, this is what the Desert Fathers believed was the essence of humility and perfection, because it was a relational perfection. So Anthony died at the ripe old age of 105, and in many ways, I can't relate to him. I haven't sold all my belongings. I've chosen a family instead of the desert, but I have found Anthony to be a tremendous companion for me in my Christian walk. I'm almost using Anthony as a metaphor for all of our need to go out to the desert for periods of time in our life. Only when Anthony went to the desert and stayed there was his false self exposed. And once it was exposed, he had to weaken it by continuing to manifest his thoughts and to claim a deeper truth about himself that he had died and risen with Christ. That Christ, and not these thoughts, were his true beloved. So what Anthony discovered after years in the desert is what we can taste again and again in Lent. Don't attempt sinlessness. This can be as full of the self as any other thing. Instead, lean into your identity as hidden in Christ. In the meantime, practice manifesting your thoughts to someone you trust. And if you are on the receiving end of someone's thoughts, the goal is not to try and fix them. The goal is to try and figure out to get beneath the thoughts. What is motivating this? Why are you obsessing about this? Why is this so compelling to you. Just being known in the midst of our thoughts can often break the thoughts hold upon us. Don't walk this Lenten road alone. And never stop paying attention. Throughout the Lenten journey, stay awake. Pay attention. Ask Christ to lead you to what you need to be attentive to in this season of your life and have fun. <laughs> so thank you for these few days of beginning to help you understand Lent. Ash Wednesday is February 18th, I believe, and that kicks off Lent. And I believe there's an online Biola-wide journey uh, set out for all of you, if you so wish. That's one way to do it, is to be reflecting on art and to re be reflecting on scripture together but the upside is also the downside of the virtual experiment, which is that you can also do this privately with your computer and not talk to anyone else about it. So I would just encourage you, find a community who you wanna walk through this with and go to the depths together. Bless you, you're dismissed. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. 
Learn more at viola.edu.